So I want to talk a bit about the levels of microbial control. This is basically going to be how we control microbes in the environment, and uh, the terminology and uh, some of the methods that we might use to do so. So first off, some terminology. Uh, sterilization is the most extreme level of microbial control. Sterilization means the removal or destruction of all microbial life, including viruses, but not prions. So, uh, prions are new enough that they don't really fit into the terminology that we already had established. Uh, plus, we don't exactly know everything that gets rid of them. But, if you say something is sterile, that means there's nothing living on it or in it. No bacteria, no fungi, no viruses. Even the really, really tough bacteria, like those, you know, deep trench bacteria, the hyperthermophiles that live at 120 degrees Celsius, they're dead. Even endospores, and endospores are almost impossible to kill. Endospores can survive, oh, uh, lots of forms of radiation, vacuum, they can survive boiling, they can survive all sorts of things. Even endospores have to be dead to say something is sterile. Uh, it should be noted that sterilization is, is kind of difficult to achieve, uh, but there are some things that we absolutely need to be sterile. Now, disinfection and antisepsis are similar, and they're both less than sterile. But they're still pretty good. They're good enough for most purposes. Uh, disinfection means getting rid of most pathogens from a non-living object. So that means, uh, you know, pretty much all viruses, because all viruses are pathogens. Uh, the vast majority of bacteria, um, but we're not going to worry about, you know, hydrothermal vent bacteria that survive up to ridiculously high temperatures, uh, because they don't really infect people, so if they're still there, we don't really care. They're also pretty rare. Uh, it also means that uh, specifically, we're not necessarily getting rid of endospores. It'll kill living, uh, free-growing endospore-forming organisms, but it won't kill them in their endospore state. Disinfection and antisepsis mean basically the same thing, uh, except disinfection, you're treating a non-living area, whereas antisepsis, you're treating a living organism. So, like, if you wash a table down with bleach, you are disinfecting the table, whereas if uh, you fall down and get a scrape and, uh, you know, your mom puts hydrogen peroxide on the wound, she's antisepsizing the wound. Um, and we separate them into two categories because a lot of things that we use to disinfect surfaces, like, you know, say, bleach, are not really very safe to use on people. So, um, so we separate them out because while most, while most antiseptics will also be disinfectants, there's a large number of disinfectants that aren't very good antiseptics. So, sanitization uh, is a specific term that means the removal of pathogens from a surface or space to meet a standard. Usually this is a public health standard of some sort, or uh, you know, like a water purity standard or something like that. It means that you have some particular code that you are adhering to and that you are cleaning the area to meet that code. 
Um, usually sanitization implies that whatever it is that you're sanitizing starts off in a non-sanitary state. So it, something starts off dirty and you have done something to it to bring it into code. Whatever code that is and whatever you're doing to it are not specified as a part of this term. Um, Degerming specifically refers to removing organisms through mechanical action. So this is usually going to be washing your hands or scrubbing a surface. Uh, it means that you are uh, using friction and often surfactants like soap or something like that to remove microorganisms from an area. But it doesn't necessarily say anything about how dirty the object was going in, or how clean it is coming out. Pasteurization uh, is specifically a term that is used for the microbial control that occurs in the food industry. And it's very specifically designed, uh, uh, defined as being the use of heat, a brief high temperature heat treatment, to reduce the number of spoilage organisms and to destroy pathogens in a, uh, in a food object, usually a liquid-based food object. So we're probably most familiar with pasteurization with milk. Uh, and milk is pasteurized so that any pathogens in it, there usually aren't very many pathogens in milk, but it's not, poss it's not impossible. Um, so the pathogens will be killed, so it has to be a, a basically a um, sort of a disinfectant level of heat. And uh, we're going to reduce the number of spoilage organisms. We're not getting rid of them all. Uh, which is why milk still spoils if you leave it around long enough. But the heat treatment, while it doesn't necessarily kill them all, it knocks them out for a while. The, it, um, the treatment is harsh enough that they sort of go into a hibernation state for a long time. And that, combined with refrigeration, will prevent them from spoiling the milk for yeah, a number of weeks, three or four weeks or so. Pasteurization is also used with a bunch of other uh, objects, um, canned goods. Uh, it was originally invented by Louis Pasteur to stop wine from, spoilizing, er, from spoiling, and um, I don't think it's used very often for that anymore, but uh, because it sort of changes the taste in an unpleasant way, but that's what it was originally designed for. The last term that I want to talk about is preservation. So far, all the terms that I've discussed have to do with a level of control at the point it is applied. If you sterilize an object, it is sterile right after you sterilize it. But it doesn't say anything about going forward into the future. If I sterilize a knife, and then I set it down on a countertop, and I go away for 20 minutes and I come back, it's probably not sterile anymore. Uh, preservation specifically applies to events going forward into the future. So preservation is action that inhibits microbial growth or microbial presence uh, in the future. So if you preserve something, then that preservation lasts. And it's very difficult to preserve sterilization, but you can usually preserve some of the lower levels. You can preserve sanitation. You can usually preserve um, mm, disinfection. Preserving antisepsis is, is, is more difficult because most preservation techniques are not very uh, amenable to being used on people, but we try sometimes. So preservation is really the only one of these uh, these terms that has a temporal component that goes forward in time. Uh, now, there's two more terms. These are not specifically related to levels of control, but rather how that control works. And these are important 
terms to keep in mind both for this section uh, and for when we're talking about um, uh, antibiotics later on. These two terms are bacteria stat and bacteria side. So side basically means killing, right? So like homicide is killing people, fratricide is killing your brother, uh, avicide is killing birds, I think. Um, and a bacteria side specifically means the killing of bacteria. So things that are bacteria sides are substances that control bacteria by killing them. And that's a pretty direct way of controlling bacteria, and it's a fairly effective one. But it's not the only way that you can control bacteria. Another possible way to control bacteria is by stopping them from growing. So one bacteria by itself, usually not a problem. But it's when it grows and it multiplies, and one bacteria becomes two, and then four, and then eight, and then a few hours later you've got like a trillion bacteria. Right, now they're a problem. So if you could do something to it, some sort of treatment that might not kill the bacteria but stops it from reproducing, it's going to stay one bacteria. And in most cases, uh, that's not going to be a huge problem. Like, that's, that's a fine level of bacteria to have, is one. Now, I should point out that all sterilants are going to be bacteria sides, but lots of the lower categories can be bacteria stats. So, what levels of control do we use in everyday life? Uh, and we do. We use a lot of different levels of control in, in a lot of different situations. So, um, the first thing to think about is in the home. Right? In our normal home, everyday life, what levels of control do you exert? Probably not sterilization. Right? That's difficult and expensive. Most of us are not, like, autoclaving our sheets or, um, you know, treating our, you know, countertops with formaldehyde or anything like that. Uh, most levels of control, the higher up they get, sort of the more control you exert, the more expensive it gets, and the more damaging it becomes to whatever you're using it on. So in the home, specifically, probably the most common level that we use is de-germing. De-germing. Sorry about that. I'm writing it with my finger on an iPad screen, so it's not exactly uh, my best work. But... Um, yeah, so we wash ourselves, our bodies, our hands. That's the level of control we usually put onto our our own bodies, is de-germing. We use soap and water and friction, and we get rid of microbes that way and we flush them down the drain. And that's pretty much what we use throughout most of our house. Um, soap and water and you scrub, Right? Vacuums are not technically de-germing techniques, but they're pretty close. They sort of go off the same general principle. Uh, now, there's, there's one area in the house that we usually take extra precaution with, and that's the kitchen. So in the, in the kitchen, in the food prep room, uh, we usually are going to use disinfection... Right? At least in many kitchens. We're going to be using some sort of um, countertop cleaner which goes beyond the level of simple scrubbing. Like maybe you're using a, a, a Clorox bleach based countertop thing, or you're using some Lysol, or you're using um, probably not Lysol, not in the kitchen. Uh, but you're using some sort of cleaner, 
um, some sort of chemical cleaner to prepare the surfaces and uh, generally speaking this is a good idea because things that you do in the kitchen eventually go inside you or at least they go into your intestinal tract and your intestinal tract is covered in mucous membranes and mucous membranes are more vulnerable to infection so stuff that goes on in the kitchen has a much greater possibility of coming into intimate contact with your uh, with with your body with your immune system um, it's not a bad idea to rub down surfaces in the kitchen with rubbing alcohol every so often uh, especially right after you work with chicken or right after you work with something uh, that you know to be a potential contaminant we also use uh, a lot of disinfecting levels of heat in the preparation of food. Uh, cooking. Cooking itself is a form of disinfection. You're using heat, and uh, the reason why cooked food takes a lot longer to spoil or go bad than raw food does um, is because the cooking kills most of the pathogenic or spoilage organisms on uh, on a thing, on, on food, essentially. And so cooking is its, itself a, uh, a, a disinfection technique. So in the hospital, your first inclination is probably going to say sterilization, right? And that's totally true. There are some parts of a hospital that are kept sterile, but not very big ones. Uh, and this is just for practical reasons. I mean, sterilization is, well, first off, sort of by definition in patients, you have, or in hospitals, you have patients. And you can't sterilize patients because anything that's going to kill all microbial life probably kills the patients as well. So anywhere you have patients, it's going to be inherently unsterile. Anywhere you have uh, open access to the public, where you can have people coming in and visiting your patients, like they're coming in, they're tracking pathogens and other bacteria all over the place. Um, they are, uh, you know, not following very good protocols. Uh, so in a hospital, you're going to have some sterilization. This is going to be in, like, surgical. Um, surgical theaters, uh, any sort of instrument or scalpel that's going to pierce the skin. So needles are sterile. Um, scalpels are sterile. All of the gauze and the instruments that might be used in surgery are going to be kept sterile. Uh and so forth. Um, and, and some of the areas where they keep very, very critically immunocompromised patients, like people who are, uh, have just had a bone marrow transplant, so they have no immune system, or people who are um, advanced HIV or something like that, they're going to be kept in probably a tent over their, their bed that, while it doesn't actually achieve sterility, it gets very close. But most of the parts of the hospital just can't be clamped sterile. So we have a lot of de-germing that goes on in hospitals. So de-germing. Uh, every time you enter a room, every time you leave a room, every time you interact with a patient, if you're a medical personnel, you're supposed to wash your hands. Like, we highly approve of washing our hands. And we're also going to have some uh, disinfection. And that's because um, when we can't sterilize, we disinfect. So we have lots of high-impact cleaners in hospitals um, that are uh, used any place that we, we can't really just, you know, sort of sterilize something. And probably... Um, the best term 
to apply to a hospital situation is going to be uh, sanitization. So I'm going to put a cross here and go sanitization. Because hospitals are all kept to a code. And different areas... Ooh, hey, that didn't move with that. Interesting. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm just going to move that aside because I don't know exactly what to do with it. Uh, in any case, uh, sanitization, everything in a hospital is kept up to a code. It's all kept up to a, a, a public health standard that is designed by hospital or that is uh, designed by the government. The hospitals have to live up to, and they're tested on a regular basis to make sure that they're meeting that code. Now, in a lab. There are, uh, things are actually mostly going to be very similar to what in a hospital. So you're going to use a lot of sterilization, uh, mostly in the autoclave. Uh, you're going to use a lot of disinfection. You know, you bleach down all the surfaces when you work on them. Uh, you're going to use a lot of degerming. Every time you enter or leave a microbiology lab, you should wash your hands. Um... There is less of a sanitization standard, though. Now, some professional labs are held to a particular code, uh, but most are not. Most, it's relied upon to meet the, uh, uh, the level of control that is most appropriate for that lab. There are some labs, however, that... Um, do have to meet a particular code, and we call these biosafety levels. And biosafety levels are a code that uh, many labs are held to, depending upon the sort of organisms that they work with. And uh, there are four biosafety levels that are commonly used. The first one is BSL-1, or biosafety level 1. Your microbiology lab that you go to as a part of microbiology class is a BSL-1 lab. Lots of labs are BSL-1 labs. Most of them are. And that means that the organisms that you work with are not human pathogens. Or they have been crippled in some way to make them not pathogenic to healthy humans. Some of them might be opportunistic pathogens, meaning that if you are immunocompromised, they could be dangerous. Or, like, if you have an open wound and you sort of smear them right in there then yeah, they might be dangerous, but for the most part, these are things that do not cause danger to humans. And BSL-1 facilities need basic lab facilities. So you've got to have a hood, you've got to have, you know, surfaces with disinfectants, so you spray down your surface with whatever. Uh, and the personnel need to have some amount of training and they need to have access to personal protective equipment, gloves, lab coats, that sort of thing. BSL-2 means that you're handling moderately hazardous agents. Uh, typically, moderately hazardous agents means that these are things that are unlikely to kill people, and uh, in addition, that they are not usually easy, easily communicable. So, for instance, salmonella is a BSL-2. Salmonella is a human pathogen. It causes salmonellosis. Anyone who's ever had food poisoning knows what that's like. But it doesn't usually kill people, and it's really kind of hard to give somebody else your salmonella. Uh, the difference between BSL-1 and BSL-2 facilities, a lot of it has to do with the training of the personnel involved. 
everyone who works in a BSL-2 facility has to be trained in proper handling of microbes, in um, how to avoid contaminating areas, in how to use the equipment in the safest way possible, and in what the particular dangers of the organisms they're working with are. Other than that, they're fairly similar as far as the physical lab goes to BSL-1. Um, they are required to have a certain level of air circulation that has to be filtered. Uh, and they are required to have a little bit of extra emergency dealing with equipment that BSL-1 facilities don't have. But most BSL-1 facilities have, in addition to the basic BSL-1 stuff, enough equipment to meet the BSL-2. Uh, the difference is going to be in the training of the personnel. So a lot of labs are officially BSL-1, but they will have a BSL-2 area where only properly trained personnel are allowed to work, and that in that area they are allowed to work with the more dangerous organisms. Uh, BSL-3 usually means that you are working with uh, diseases that are either fatal but less contagious or contagious but less fatal. Um, so a good BSL-3 organism is anthrax, right? If you get anthrax, you're probably going to die. It's extremely fatal, but... It only affects you. So if you get anthrax, you're not going to go out and infect the community. Um, BSL-3 facilities <clears throat> have to be, uh, they have to have a separate room that's disconnected from the entire uh, rest of, of the place. And uh, that room only BSL-3 trained people can be in. It has to have its own separate air supply. Uh, and usually you have to go into sort of like a waiting chamber where you will change into a different set of, of clothing covers. Then you go into the BSL-3 portion. You do your work there. You come out and then you leave the covers behind in that area. So you can't even... Um, use the same equipment. Like, nothing can be brought out of a BSL-3 facility unless it goes through a decontamination procedure. Uh, the, the air in a BSL-3 facility can't go into general circulation. It has to have its own special cleaning protocol. And uh, since many BSL-3 organisms are also bioterror agents, uh, usually a BSL-3 facility will... Um, have to have different safety regulations. So some sort of identification or security protocol uh, before you're allowed to enter into the BSL-3 area. BSL-3 uh, labs are rare, but, well, they're uncommon, but not rare. Most big universities and lots of industries are going to have dedicated BSL-3 labs. ASU has several. Most universities will have several. But most labs at ASU are not BSL-3. ASU has a couple. I know of at least... I know of at least one, and I'm sure there are more. Uh, but most labs at ASU don't meet that qualification. BSL-4, uh, here we're talking about what you see in, like, movies like Contagion or Outbreak or whatever. These are the places where, um, at, like, CDC or NIH facilities, uh, where you've got the people in those, like, self-contained environmental suits. And if there gets a hole in a suit, then they have to go to... Um, quarantine, and here you're working with uh, microbes that cause severe or fatal diseases and that are easily spread from person to person. 
So it isn't just that you're worried about the personnel, you're worried about the microbe escaping into the community and, uh, and the, the severe damage that that could cause. Usually BSL-4 areas are going to be a completely different building that's separated. Um, and the building itself will be under, you know, fairly severe uh, uh, security and... Everyone who enters that building, you know, down to the janitors, has to have special training. Um, the, like I said, the personal protective equipment is much more severe. You're either working with organisms in self-contained cabinets through, like, these rubber gloves that are a part of the cabinet, or you're working inside of a, a, a environmental suit, like a, a rubber you know, bunny suit like the Intel guys do, uh, or or often, you know, you might be, uh, they might have some sections of the area which uh, have less, uh, which have less protection going on, but those are like designated areas. The default is to have lots of protective equipment everywhere. And I think that usually these facilities can un uh, have to be able to undergo a lockdown in the case of a, um, the, a an event, if there needs to be a lockdown. These level of facilities are rare. Most universities don't have one. I don't think that ASU has a BSL-4. I don't think that most universities have a BSL-4. Some companies probably do. Uh, and a lot of, or not a lot, but some government facilities do. The big ones, uh, mostly found somewhere in the D.C. area. Okay, so, quiz. A nurse takes a needle out of a package, swipes your arm with alcohol, and gives you a shot. What levels of control are used in this case? Select all that apply. So we have sterilization. Disinfection, antisepsis, degerming, preservation, and immunization. Go ahead and pause the uh, the video now and uh, select your answer before continuing. It'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, so uh, the answers are sterilization and antisepsis. So the needle that she's giving you a shot with is sterile. Anything that pierces your skin usually uh, has to be sterile because it's coming in direct contact with your blood. Antisepsis is uh, when the nurse swipes your arm with alcohol. That's an antiseptic. It's not a sterilant. Uh, and it's being applied to you, a human, an organism, so disinfection is when it's applied to an inanimate surface, and antisepsis is when it's applied to living tissue. So that's both of what's going on. Some of the others here are sort of implied. Like the nurse probably washed her hands, so that might be degerming. Um, there was probably some sort of uh, preservation material in the shot. There's probably some disinfection going on if it's in a hospital, but the only two that we directly see here are antisepsis and sterilization. Now, immunization is interesting. Um, we didn't say exactly what sort of shot she, she was giving, but it could have been a vaccination, uh, in which case immunization would be going on, but immunization is not a specific level of control. It's not one of those terms that we defined at the beginning of this chapter. 